Hey everyone, thank you for being here. Welcome back to another one of our demystifying post-production webinars. And this month it's all to do with redshift materials. And I'm joined with the lovely Jonas, Lionel, Darren, and Mr. Simon Walker. Hey guys, how's it going? Hello. Hello. Hey. Great. And also hey, hey to everyone else. Hey to everyone in the chat. Jay, Sharon, Anders, Rob, uh, lovely to see you all, um, the regulars in there. So yeah, thanks for you know saying hi everyone. It's nice to nice to see you all again on this on this Monday afternoon for me. Okay, cool. So uh, what are we going to be doing today? So we're going to be taking a look at some more redshift materials and in particular procedural materials. So, you know, we're going to have a look at the method of creating procedural materials such as, you know, stone, wood, marble, ice, all those really cool things. So it's going to be re it's really, some really fun stuff that we're going to be going through today. But before we get into it, I'm going to do the usual housekeeping. So if you haven't seen it already, we have a events page on our Maxon, our main Maxon website. And here we have a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing, not only this week, but also this month and throughout the whole year. We've got so much, so much going on. We're super busy, but we love it. We love bringing this stuff to you guys. So if you don't know already, every second and fourth Thursday, we run a Ask the Trainer. And, you know, sometimes it's themed, sometimes we have guests, sometimes we just sit and answer your guys' questions on like, anything. And we try and answer them live uh, as much as we can. If you haven't checked out already, I would seriously recommend uh, VFX and Chill with Hashi and Seth. They are, they are so much fun and it's an incredible kind of talk show which is focused all around visual effects, but you just have a great time with them. And so you kind of forget that you're learning because you're just having a good time. So yeah, I'd seriously recommend uh, checking some of those out there every Friday um, at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time as well. Uh, some of you may know, Great phrase. Uh -huh. Forget that you're learning. That's the, that's the best way. That, that's the best way of learning. <laughs> um, some of you may know that um, me and Matt, another one of our trainers, are doing a hands-on with Max on Cinema 4D Beginners Workshop. And we're already up to week three. I can't believe how quickly like these six weeks are going. And so, you know, if you're new to Cinema 4D or, you know, never used it before, or you kind of want to pick up some tips and tricks, I'd recommend checking that out. It's really aimed at, you know, you guys. And this week is all kind of lighting and materials. So, you know, lots of lots of cool stuff in there. And on that same day, you guys are totally spoiled for choice because we also have the 3D motion design show. So we have some amazing artists showing some amazing stuff on that, as well as our second Hands On with Max On, kind of workshop, which is all things to do with particles inside of Cinema 4D, After Effects and Red Giant. And that's with Nick and Chad. And so, you know, so much going on this week and like this whole month, got loads, loads of cool stuff. And as you guys know, everything that we do is recorded and is put onto our Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. So, you know, if you've if you've not checked that out, I seriously recommend it, you know, drop us a sub if you fancy it. We've, we've hit 6K, so, you know, we're, we're getting there and we just love bringing this content to you guys and you know it's it's really nice to see that that you guys love it as well because you know we do so if you wanted to check out last week's uh Leonel went through some amazing tips and tricks inside of um redshift materials so building those from scratch as well as you know all stuff about gamma overrides just some really interesting stuff um and we've also time stamped it so you know if you want to kind of skip ahead to something you think is like super relevant then you can absolutely do that Lastly, we have our Maxon certification, which we like to talk to you guys about. And so, you know, if you're ever interested in like learning and seeing where you're at with um, Cinema 4D or whether you're ready to maybe take the certification, when we have this um, like elementary knowledge test and it's, it's totally free, takes you up to an hour. And, you know, it's a really great place to start and see where you're at with um, Cinema 4D and maybe see if you're ready to then take that certification. Um, and very soon, very, very, very soon, we are going to have a Redshift uh, version two, which the guys have been working on, Darren in particular. So, you know, that's that's totally coming soon. Um, yeah, so before I hand over, uh, don't forget, we've got questions and a chat section. So, you know, let us know any of your questions and what we'll do, we'll make sure we answer them live throughout the whole thing. And we also have a PDF in the handout section, which has all the things like project files, you know, links to these recordings, as well as a link to get your very own Maxon t-shirt so you can rep along with us. And yeah, all you have to pay is the um, shipping. So yeah, 
check that out. Cool, right. I guess that's uh, enough from me. Jonas, do you want to uh, talk us through what you've been going through today? Uh, yeah. Um, I can also share my screen. Yeah. And just let me grab it from you. Here we go. So now everyone should see my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. So what we are seeing here is, um, well, basically the the key visual that I created for um, this session. And today we're going to talk about procedural materials. And I want to especially talk about that uh, wood shader that I created. So if I zoom in a little bit, um, you can see there's a lot of detail going on. We've got we've got these rings here. Let it Let's clear it up a little bit. And a lot of fine detail here. And the cool thing it's, uh, is that it's completely procedural. So um, many people might think, why should I take the time and create materials procedurally? Because the internet is full of incredibly good textures. And uh, Lionel uh, told us yesterday how you can use them and uh, what's the best way to, to set materials up using those textures. But there are some situations where procedural materials are also either a good alternative or maybe even better. So, well, procedural materials really come with many advantages. And one of them is you don't need textures, which <laughs> means, or not as many, which means that A, um, you don't, well, you lower the risk of uh, missing dependencies uh, once you want to share the project with someone else. Um, you also have a smaller project size. And the other thing that is cool is that shaders are always mathematical. Well, this term might be a little bit scary, but what it means is that those textures are procedural and resolution independent. So you could go from, um, well, a very wide shot into a close-up of this wood material, for example, and it would hold up, hold up in all distances. And the other thing is that, especially when you're working with noises and so on, then you don't even need UVs. There are procedural materials, of course, where you or shaders where you need UVs, um, but many of them um, are well. Well, you can use them without UVs. So. Yeah, here is uh, the wood shader. You can have another look at it uh, because the next thing I'm going to do, or, or the first thing, is I'm going to create this whole thing from scratch. So let me go to File, New Project, and let me disable the Redshift IPR for a second. And did I disable it? Here we go. And we just create a cube. We make it. Oh, well, two meters wide is okay. And then let's say we go five and 20, something like that. Then we have something like a, like a wood plank. And we are also going to create a redshift material. So I go to create, redshift, materials, material, and assign it to the queue. All right, now let's make it a little bit smaller and let's bring up the redshift shader graph. Because the first thing that I want to show you is how you can create those rings. And the way I did this, let me start the IPR. The way I did this is by using a noise and combining it with the RAM. So basically everything that I'm going to show you today is a combination of noises, RAMs, and layer shaders. That's basically it. Every now and then I will use another node, but that's the ones that uh, we're heavily relying on. So, all right, let's start with creating the rings. And there's also the first thing that I want to make you aware of. If you are using a node material, and let's say we create a RAM for now, what we see, the one thing that's obvious, and let me connect this to the output, is that, 
well, this is a ramp. This is a color ramp from black to white. But the other thing is that this is not just color what we see here. This is also data. And I prepared a link for you, and I think Ellie is going to share it um, because I recorded a, a tutorial about data types and node-based material systems. And definitely check that out because it gives you some very valuable basic knowledge about node-based material systems in general. And once you understood which material, uh, which um, uh, data types are carrying what type and what kind of data and how many, um, how many, um, how much data, um, this is very useful. So what we have in the ramp here is color from black to white, but it's also, if, you, if we're talking uh, through this um, by using numbers as, as a reference, we're going from zero to one. Now, the first thing that I want to do in order to make those rings happen um, is I want some sort of procedural ramp that allows me to add as many rings as I want to. And those rings are defined by one gradient here. So what I can do is I can search for a multiply node. It's called mul, and we're going to use the scalar one. Scalar always means that this is um, well a scalar value, which means um, that it's a value with um, numbers after the point, so decimals and so on. And we're going to pipe the ramp into the multiply node. And then we're going to multiply the whole thing with one for now. And I'm also going to use this in the surface out. And this won't make any difference. But if I bring this up to, let's say, 10, you can see that the gradient goes from here to here, which is the range between 0 and 1. But then there is 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, up to 10. 10 is up here. But you can see from 1 to 10, it's just white, because um, the display is clamped to values between 0 and 1. But we can use data below and uh, above uh, 0 and 1. So that's good to know. So actually, what we have here is a white that's 10 times brighter than the white we have here. That is very, very complex and, and abstract, but uh, that's the way it is. So how can we map this in a way that we're getting 10 gradients here? Well, the answer is a, a node that is called mod. It's the modulo node. And basically, what a modulo does, and I'm going to switch to another one of my favorite apps, which is text edit, um, is a little bit of primary school math. And we're having zero divided by three equals zero, three divided by three, uh, by three equals one, and six divided by three equals two. But what did we do back in primary school when we had to divide one by three or two by three? I can tell you. What we did was we said that the result is zero, but we've got a remainder of one. And here with zero, we got a remainder of zero. We just never wrote that um, in primary school, but it was there. And then two divided by three also equals zero, but we've got a remainder of two. And if you carry on with that sequence, you've got a remainder of zero again here. If you divide four by three, you've got a result of one and a remainder of one and so on. So five by three is one with a remainder of two. And now you should see something that is very interesting. By using these remainders, we are getting a sequence, a repetitive sequence. It's one, uh, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, and so on. And this goes until infinity. So we can use this remainder in order to create repetitions. And this is exactly what the modulo does. It gives you this remainder value. All right, so let's just pipe the multiply node into the modulo node. And here you go. Now we've got 10 gradients here. 
And the funny thing now is, if I use a noise as the input, like so, hey, let's make it a little bit smaller. World scale, let's say 0 0.5. And yeah, if I use this as the input and connect the modulo back to the surface, we get this. So we are mapping values from black to white or zero to one onto these gradients. And the cool thing is that it's a procedural setup. So by adjusting the, mul the multiplier here, we can add more rings to our wood, so to speak, or less, depending on which value, value we are choosing. And we can also adjust the the basic noise here so if we for example want this to be stretched we can scale it non-uniformly for example by 10 in x direction and then we're getting something like this and you see where this is going um this is already looking quite good maybe let's let's bring this up to something like 40 and then the next thing i want to do is i want to be able to distort um, a noise. So how can I do that? Let me show you. I'm going to use a noise and I'm going to connect it to the output. And instead of using the noise, well, the type noise, I'm going to use cell noise because here we can clearly see that we have squares here. And there is a parameter in the noise called offset. And if I do something like um, 0 0.2, for example, you can see that this whole line here went down. If I bring this up again to zero, the line is here again. All right, what can we do with that knowledge? Well, we can try to feed that value with another noise in order to get, well, like a, a relative offset value, a value that is different in all places here. And I'm going to do this by adding another noise. Let's solo this one. And let's make it way smaller, like so. And now I want to connect it to the input coordinate offset and throw this into the surface. And now you can see that we are distorting this whole noise here. And now again, if you think about those colors as data, you will find out that now the brightness of color two, the white, is our power slider for the distortion. Look at this. So here we go. So once you get that a note-based system does not just carry color, but data, and you know how to use that, um, your setups um, have the potential to become really powerful. So now we've got a distorted cell noise here. That's cool. All right, but instead of piping that into um, this noise here, I'm going to pipe it into the one that I created for the wood. So let's do this and let's output the wood here. And here you can see that we now have a distorted um, wood pattern here. And that's pretty much the base of what I want to do. Maybe we can adjust it a little bit. I also want to uh, want it to be stretched. Let's say three in X direction should be good. And then we can again have a look at the strength of distortion. And I think something like that is cool. So we get a little bit of variation. The thing about creating procedural materials is that you need to add this variation back. That is completely normal uh, if you take a photograph um, um, to get a texture or something. But uh, with procedural materials, you need to bring back all of these imperfections and, and this stuff. And for such things, um, this workflow is quite cool. Always add as much de uh, detail as you can. All right. So another thing that is quite cool about procedural materials is when I go to the cube's geometry and add a fillet, we can see that it's that it's still working. We can 
bring this down a little bit. So it doesn't care about UVs and such because we are using um, object mode for everything here. That means that this, these noises that we're using are always relative to the object position. So if I move the object around, if I rotate it, it will stay in place. But um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. <laughs> cool. Let me also bring up the fillet subdivision a bit to get a better rounding here. All right. And now I want to add a little bit more stuff. I want to add some noises. And in order to do that, I need a layer shader. So I type in layer here. We're going to use the color layer. Give this our input and this the output. And now you can see that it's turning black because by default, layer one is already activated, uh, but we don't have anything in there. So here we are back once we disabled um, this layer. All right. And now I'm going to add another noise. So let's add another noise and let's add it to layer one color. I'm going to activate it again and now we can set it up. Okay, what do we want? First of all, whenever you create a procedural material, just click one type and then use the up and down arrows to, to navigate through those noises. And once you find one that is good, like this one, like this one, then you just choose it. I'm gonna scale it down. Let's say 0 0.1 should be good. And that's looking fantastic. I'm gonna add some stretching. And I'm also going to adjust the clipping a little bit. So I want this to be a little bit darker. And maybe the overall scale also a little bit lower, something like that. And here we go. That's our first noise. And now in the layer shader, we just need to find um, a blend mode that looks good and that allows us to uh, combine the two that we created, like the, the rings and this noise here. So in this case, because we've got bright spot, we need something that um, that makes it a little bit brighter in these areas, like lighten. Lighten seems to be good. And I'm also, yeah, I'm happy with that. Cool. All right, then let's just add a copy of this. Just hold down control and drag, and this way you can add another node. And let's add this to color two. And I'm gonna activate it here. And in the noise, I'm going to switch the colors. And there is a cool, fast way to do that. You just need to hold down shift, and then you can drag one um, color onto the other and release the mouse and this will switch the two. Then I'm going to bring down the scale a little bit more and adjust the seed to add a little bit of variation. And this is already good. I can set the blend mode now. Let's set this to something like um, multiply to make it a little bit darker. And you can see we are getting there. So we've got bright spots and we've got darker spots and maybe maybe those are a little bit too big still so let's make this 0 0.05 and this one 0 0.02 that's okay and then i'm gonna add another one add it to layer three color and let's say we want to activate this one and also adjust the seed and the size again. And we can go to three. All right. And I'm going to set up a blend mode. In this case, I think I'm going to use average. And this will just, well, it does not look really good right now, but it allows me to do something with um, color remapping that I can show you um, in a second. 
All right, let's move these aside. So we already got a pretty good structure here, pretty good pattern. And I'm going to add another ramp in order to create our final pattern. So let's just use this as an input and use this as the output. And now we can play around with these values. So here I can bring back the black. And another thing that I can do, which I quite like, is that I can create a copy of this one and bring it to this side. And what's happening is that we are breaking up those, um, those hard edges here. And this looks quite cool. So let me do something like, like this. I like that. Look at this. It's it became a little bit dirtier and well, just more natural. Okay, and now the next thing would be to colorize it. I won't do it in this ramp because I want this ramp only to to remap those colors here. So I'm going to add another one, and this is where I'm going to do my colorization. Like so. And I'm going to bring up the colors here and create some brownish tone like this. And some tone that is a little bit brighter than that. I'm just going to create a copy here and let me make it a little bit brighter. Maybe also tint it more towards yellow, desaturated, or saturated more. Well, let's let's do something like this. So we are already we're already getting there. All right, cool. So what I would usually do, uh, but we are uh, already at half past six here, or half past, depending on your time zone. It's not half past six. Um, usually, what I would do here, well, let let me do this because um, it's it's also quite a cool tip involved here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a copy of this whole section of the noises. And I'm going to bring it to this place and use it as an input and use this one as an output. But what I want to do to the noises is I want to adjust the seat. So we've got a seat of one to three, a seat of one to four, and a seat of one to five. And I don't want these seats to be the very same as in these noises. So what I can do is I can simply use the value that is in there by typing x and then just um, add something like 1000 to this value because all of the um, input fields inside of Cinema 4D are capable of calculating. Now I press enter and what I get is a seed of 1123, 1124, 1125. So that's a pretty handy thing. And now I want to set all of the modes here to multiply and just swap the colors in this one. And I'm gonna create some variation here on the masks. So what this allows me is to have uh, those little imperfections tinted black. So the other ones have been tinted towards this brownish tone, and now I introduced another color um, by adding some of them on top. And you can see it's, it's pretty nice. All right, so that's basically what I wanted to do with the color channel. Now let me just create the bump channel, and then I'm going to break down the rock material that I created in order to save some time. So what I do is I pipe this into the base um, diffuse color of the material node and pipe this into the surface output. All right, so now we've got color in our shader, but not too much um, other stuff. So I want to create um, a bump based on what we have here. And I'm just going to do that by 
copying this part again down here and also adding another ramp to this place. And I want to use our initial color. Wait, I'm going to use this one. So this one is, yeah, this one is the one where we already used the color remapping. I'm going to pipe this into this ramp because by using this ramp, I want to create the height map for the bump. So what I do is I'm going to invert the colors here and pipe it into this guy. Let's see what it looks like. And let's also reduce the black value here. Yeah, I like that. Okay, and now we can use this in the bump. So let me add a bump map node. Bump. Here we go. Let's just add the color to this one and then pipe this into the overall bump input. And this one into the output. All right, right now it's pretty extreme. We have to go down with the height scale pretty much. So let's go to 0 0.03. And now it's looking much better. Maybe let me add a dome light. Like so, and now we can see a little bit of these imperfections. It would be even better if we had a texture in there. So let's add an HDR texture. Let's use one of the studio setups here. Maybe this one. And here we go. So that's looking not too bad, maybe a little bit too, too shiny. So we can adjust the the roughness of the reflection a bit. And we could also use um, another noise in here. We could bring down the whole uh, reflection weight. But here you can see this is a pretty, well, it's a pretty fast setup. Of course, it takes a while to, to create it, but it is resolution independent. And you can go pretty close and you can see there is no pixelation and stuff like that. So it's all holding up. Of course, you can spend a lot more time on refining this, but yeah, that's that's basically the thing. I think I showed two pretty cool techniques here, especially the one with the uh, with the modulo where I created the rings. And again, this is procedural. We can still reduce the count of rings like so, um, and we can also um, adjust the size of the input noise make it bigger something like this and this way we can create many different um, wood materials also by adjusting the colors and so on that's a pretty cool thing all right now let me switch to another scene because i want at least to break down or maybe well ellie uh, switched on her camera so i guess there are some questions I, I was going to ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, so we've had some, which the guys have been answering in the background, but I'm yeah. thinking it might be handy to answer them live for anyone who's watching the recording later on. So yeah, sure. one was, uh, what's the advantages of kind of using Maxon noise over uh, regular noise nodes? Well, this is pretty easy. Um, the Maxon noise node is way more versatile. There are more options. If I compare the two, noise and maxon noise, you can see that in the noise node, um, the noise types are just three different ones, fractal turbulence and cell. And in the relative maxon noise, um, we can see that we've got this whole list of, well, different patterns and so on. And yeah, this is why I always use the maximum noise because it's also procedural. It doesn't have to be baked or something. It's natively implemented. So you've got resolution independent um, noises here. And yeah, they are way more flexible. So that's that's the reason why I use them and why I always um, recommend using them in, um, instead of the um, normal noise. 
the usual noise. Cool. Um, and yeah, there's another one from Dan. If all your seeds start on one, is there a quick way to get a varying seed across the board? I never tried that, but we can do now. So there is a way of, of creating variation um, using the same technique that I showed you earlier. Um, when you're in the object manager, but well, sometimes it works. Well, there's also a variable called num and um, in the object manager, it will count the objects and give you the selection index of this object. And if you multiply this by any number, could also be one, then well, multiple values. Look at this, is it two? one and zero could you also x plus rnd that's something we can try but is this going to um plus rnd this will create random seeds um yeah do i have to add some more stuff in here yeah. yes i have to x time or well, plus random and then is one value enough? Uh, it might be. Um, if you do two, then you set the range of random. Yeah. Uh, well, let's. Da, da, da. Okay, let's go. X plus random. Well, maybe. You know what? I go to the help. Um, here we go. Where's my help? Help! <laughs> it's not here. Let's bring it up like so. Ah, here it is. Okay, and then there is one um, a page called appendix. It's at the bottom of the list on the left. Appendix. Yeah, that's that's it. Uh, formula appendix. Here we go. Is it this one? No. Yeah. Yeah, and then the formula page in there. I think I'm blind at the moment. Formula, here we go. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is a list of all of the stuff that you can um, type into the input fields. And here we've got random, and usually between random between zero and A. So in theory, what I just did should have worked. Let me try again seed well maybe first of all we need a value one plus random and then let's type in 50 here here we go yeah we, it is possible right now it just uh, created the one for for everything we need to multiply this or well, add the index to it I've just I've just tried to enter random, and then use the num as a um, modifier. It works so R and D parenthesis, and then num, and it works. It gives some uh, random value. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it worked already. Um, we just need to find the way. Well, we need to multiply it with the with the index. So if we if we go, well, um, num times random and then type in 50 for example and another one so this well i mistyped it again well it, it should work um yeah. i don't know if we need to do this right now <laughs> no. uh, because i want to show you some some other cool stuff that well the the point is you can input uh variables here so you can just uh use num uh plus one or something to create multiple variations here of the seat. That's possible. If you select all of the noises um, in one go, so they all need to be selected at the same time, then it's going to work. All right, is there another question? Uh, no, that was, uh, that was it. But yeah, if there's any more, I'll, uh, I'll give you a shout. Okay, so let me jump into this one. And here I've got some stones. And what I want to show you here is 
basically just the breakdown of this stone material because we don't have the time to recreate it from scratch. But let me open up the rock texture here. It's, um, well, you can see it here. It's, again, it's just a lot of noises, layer nodes, ramps, that's pretty much it. So let's, let's go through this. And um, let's set this as the output, and I already created a shortcut for that. So here we go. This is one of the noises, then this is one of the noises, this one as well, and we've got the curvature um, node going in here. And this gives me a mask for the convex parts of the object. So if I have a look at the color layer, because this is where they are all coming together, you can see that this is our base layer noise. Then in overlay mode, I added another noise, and then I added another noise. You, you can add um, many noises here. Um, but the cool thing is once you combine noises, it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a custom noise then. And you can create more variation and uh, it's less repetitive and more pleasing, more natural to the eye. So the last one here um, makes or is making pretty much, um, well, a three-dimensional object out of this um, when it comes to shading. Right now it's a noise, but it's pretty flat. And now you can see that this um, curvature node is highlighting the edges. And this is actually something that I saw quite often when I um, had a look at rocks. So what I'm doing then is colorizing this. And now I have to do it this way for some reason. So I've got a ramp, which is gray, black, and greenish somehow. And then I pipe this into the diffuse color. And the other thing that is interesting here is the, um, the texture or the noise combination that I'm using for reflection roughness, and as well as the one that I'm using for bump. All right, and then there is another interesting thing, which is this color user data node because this node introduces variation to all of these rocks so by default or in the setting that i chose which is the attribute name set to uh, redshift geometry id color you can find this here geometry id color that's the one this returns well one individual color for per object where this material is assigned to. And I just pipe this into the color layer here. And the color layer uh, node is just bringing down the intensity of this color. So the base layer color is white and I'm just adding the random color here uh, by just a little amount. And then I pipe this into the overall color. You can find this under overall. Here we go. That's the overall tint. And yeah, once I did that, it looked like this. Yeah, and then I added some displacement. So I added another noise. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the, the whole thing. If you want to add displacement to an object, you don't um, just need to add displacement here of using the displacement node and then pipe it into the displacement output, the output um, node, displacement input on the output node. That's what I wanted to say. You also have to um, create a redshift tag for the objects that you want the displacement um, to happen on. And in here, you can define uh, tessellation or subdivision, and you can also define the displacement. Including, including the maximum displacement and the displacement scale. All right, so that's basically the breakdown of the stone object. I'm gonna share this project here. I'm also gonna share uh, the other one so you can um, investigate the materials that I created. And well, 
are there any more questions? Otherwise, uh, we can hand over to Darren, who is also going to show you a few more procedural material setups. I think the oh. only other question really was when mm -hmm. using procedural textures, do you always use object mapping? Well, it depends. Um, it depends. Usually I use object mapping because this way, um, I also use it in here. So if I grab this stone here, for example, and I rotate it, um, the whole um, the whole thing, the whole shader is based on the axis of the object and it will always stay relative to this axis. So when I rotate this object, the noises are um, in the same position. And that's something you, you want to have. It's uh, becoming a little bit more difficult when you start deforming it. I actually didn't test it with these stones, but um, if you want to rotate the noise itself, what you can do is you can enable modify axis mode and then rotate the axis. And here, now you can see that I'm rotating the shader. But I'm also adjusting the axis of the object. The shader always stays relative to um, the axis of the object when it's in object mode. But that's also what I like about it, as long as you don't have to deform the object. Cool. I've got a couple more coming, actually. Um, are these stones high poly or low, your stone uh, objects? These stones are, well, they are, let's say, middle poly. Um, I'll just get rid of the materials and enable this. So that's the resolution of the stones. And I created those stones procedurally inside of Cinema 4D. It was just um, spheres and uh, with a displacer on it and some Voronoi noises. So you can do a lot of crazy stuff with noises. Yeah, that's the geometry. Cool. More uh, questions? More, um... If I was creating a porous stone, such as like a pumice stone, would it be achievable simply by increasing the intensity of the bump map in negative space to create the volcanic pores? Well, you can bring the, the bump to a negative scale and this will just invert the bump. So what, what you need to know about, about uh, displacement and bump is that, well, this is also data but just like coded into a color channel so if you're using a bump a bump map the value 50 percent gray is your actual surface if you go higher than that um, you will have parts of the object appearing to um, come out and if you go below 0 0.5 um, it looks like they are going in but in a bump map, this is always just a fake. Um, if you really want the uh, geometry to be displaced, then you need to um, put it into uh, the displacement channel. But the principle behind it, behind the color coding, that 50% gray is the actual surface and hot, um, brighter um, goes up and uh, darker is going down, um, that's, that's it, pretty much. Cool, thanks. Uh, also, will this material map correctly in a Voronoi fracture? Do you know? Um, that's a good question. I didn't try, but, um, well, that's that's actually a really good question. I think you would have to, to adjust it to be based on UVs then. Well, we, we can just give it a try. Let's, yeah. um, Should work. let's, let's uh, create Okay, let's make it 20 by 20 by 20, something like that. Let's apply the material. Well, I think as long as it's on the cube itself, it should work. So let's enable it. Well, maybe let's, yeah, let's enable it first. Here we go, start IPR. 
So now we've got the material on here, and now we're going to add a Voronoi fracture object. Well, it adjusted it. It's a bit different now, but let's double check here. Oh, it seems to be seems to be good. Yeah, seems to work. Cool, thanks. Thanks for showing it. All righty. Cool. So now I think it's uh, the time for Darren to cap uh -oh. uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to bring all of his stuff to teach all of his stuff in nine minutes. Yeah, I, I'm there in <laughs> I'm so um, I can do a. Uh, why don't do I do a quick? Screen? I'm sorry. Do you want yeah, to grab the screen? Yeah, let me. So I'm going to do just a quick breakdown, um, showing how I used uh, some noises to uh, blend a, um, a oldie but goodie tin the uh, tin tile. Um, because I actually thought it was all, I actually thought uh, Jonas was taking the whole time today. <laughs> Oops. Ah, so okay. Let me... Well, I can I can also create marble and stuff like that. That's that's no problem. Um. Okay. Uh, well, let me uh, sh just show this real quick since I have it up. Um. So let's see here. So I, you know, essentially I have two materials for this uh, ceiling tile. I have like a clean one and I have a dirty one. Um, and to reveal the dirt, I'm actually using a number of different noises. So let me actually, uh, Jonas, I can use the solo, right? Instead of connecting it to the output. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yes. so first I'll do the base layer, which is the curvature. If, It'll allow me. I'm clicking on it, but it's not. Ah, all right. Yeah, then then go to um to the view or note to the note menu. Yes. And set it to solo. Okay. Let's go ahead and get that going. Okay. So uh, here's the curvature node. And uh, I'm just gonna sort of break these down real quick. I, I then have uh, ambient occlusion, which is um, just in its base occlusion. Uh, so let's see, there's no keyboard shortcut assigned to that solo, is there? Uh, nope. Okay. Okay, so. Well, it, you can do that pretty quickly. So you can, yeah, you can show people how to set up keyboard shortcuts. Awesome ones. Yeah, we've done that before. I don't want to mess with that right now. <laughs> um, and then let's see, I have a Maxon noise and it is a gaseous. And let's see, I did up the octaves for some additional detail. Not that it's particularly visible. Um, and oops, let's close that. Um, okay, so just sort of some rough overall interference essentially and do, do, do another uh let's see oh i inverted the curvature and then i have let's go to this final one here and then i'll show you them all together uh what is this uh, oh this is an fbm for some finer uh some finer high frequency detail now let's see how these are all blended together There we go. So we can see like that curvature, the parts that are sticking out are overall lighter than the recessed parts and all the like smaller nooks and crannies are getting the ambient occlusion. We have some noise that bits that are brighter. So we're gonna see more of a, uh, of a dirty material there. And that is 
this guy right here. So let me show you the base material. Um, and this is going into the node, uh, into the reflection color. So it's modifying the reflection. It's also being used in the bump um, in this in this material, because uh, I didn't want the reflection to be, uh, you know, uniform across the whole thing. And then the other material, let's solo that real quick. You know, this is, it's like the type of, we can see a bit of that grime coming through in those, those bits, but you know, it's the type of thing where it's like, I uh, spent so much time like iterating and tweaking things. Um, and it's uh, it's it's hard to go over in, in a couple minutes. Uh, but now you can see that there's a bit more of that sort of oxidized metal look sort of coming through in bits. Yeah, it's looking great. So, um, and then, you know, this blending uh, also occurs between the, uh, the bump mapping uh, of these two material states. So, um yeah that's that's it i was really interested in uh seeing marble uh and that that gold um but oh well that well i can i can quickly show it so well at least how i would create it so well basically um Lionel created a gold material um last week and what i would do is pretty much the same but instead of using textures using a combination of noises so instead i would try um yeah creating some sort of of marble so what i would do is i would start off with another uh, redshift material here and just add it to the cube let's get rid of the Voronoi fracture we don't need it for now and in here let's try to bring up the shader graph and then add a noise so the first thing i always add is a max on noise to oh just create those um type of procedural textures. And then what I usually do is, first of all, I go through all of these settings and try to find something that matches my need. And I think, well, this one could work. FBM. And I'm just uh, going down with the uh, down arrow key. This one is also good, Naki. This one could work. Oh, I think this one is perfect. All right, yeah, let's let's go with uh, Foxo, which is actually the same noise that I that I uh, used for for um, the small um, spots in the wood material, and then. The, the next thing is just adding a ramp and see where I can take it. So let's input the noise into the ramp and just remap the values to other colors. What color do we want this model to be? Well, let's go with a, with a red brownish one, something like that. And then it's, it's really all about just creating those those gradients and and spots and so on and another thing i want to do is to bring this down and make it a little bit less saturated so we can also add another Another knot here. Well, actually, 
I don't like the color. It's, it's a bit too extreme for my taste. And maybe the, the input noise is, is, is not the best one. Thought it might look better. So let's go through these. What we need is something that is a little bit more well, like this one, wavy turbulence. Here we go. That's looking good. Okay, yeah. And then, well, we could also combine it with another noise, but the principle behind it is use a noise or a combination of noises and then color remap it to your liking. And well, the white is definitely too bright. But this is a good starting point. This is, uh, we, we could take this somewhere cool. Yeah, this is, this is how I would approach it. And then just pipe it into the diffuse color. And in this case, I think, um, yeah, that, that would be it for a very um, basic model shader. That's an excellent, like, like starting uh starting layer like if you're gonna yeah. you know put a whole bunch of time into it and build it up yeah, yeah that's awesome yeah there's also one well that this is something i can i can show you there is the bathroom vanity which one is it i think it's this one this is also one that i once recreated using redshift and here if you have a look at the marble you can see that this is also just a layer shader. And if you go in there, I mean, it's not a redshift material, but if you have a look at these noises, you can 100% recreate this. It's just, well, it's a stupid noise in normal mode, then a voxel noise on top of that, a hard light, a blending mode, then a Naki with difference. Well. Using difference is always a very good idea because this uh, can create really cool, really cool stuff. Yeah, and then it's a filter and a colorizer, and that's it. And if you have a look at this, let's let's open this up in a window and make it bigger. Oh, it doesn't it doesn't re render. Oh, it does re render the preview. Here you can see how detailed this is, and it's just it's just incredible. And it's just a combination of these three noises. That's it. That's giving you this result. And it's fully reproducible inside of Redshift. So that's that's a pretty cool one. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, I'm just having a little look. <laughs> Um, so one that might be handy, yeah, for, for anyone re-watching the recording is um, would you use noises to add damage and dents and things like that? Which, yeah, I would. Yeah, uh, why not? Um, I mean, the, the best way to, to add some, well, any sort of imperfections to a procedural material is a noise. Um, because the noise is, well, visually dirty by default, let's put it like that. and um, yeah, sure. So whenever I want to add some variation and I don't have the a good texture for it, I, I try, well, before I start searching for the perfect noise, I try creating my own perfect noise using a combination of noise shaders. So yeah, that's, that's it. They all look, yeah, they all look amazing. Like those textures look very cool. The way you're laying up the, the noises, yeah, it looks amazing. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Right. Shall I uh, do you want to chuck the screen at me and we'll do some final yeah. bits? Yeah. Thanks. Just, thanks just for grab it. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. I love sharing that stuff. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah, it was really cool. And to Darren and uh, Lionel who've been answering your questions in the background as well, which has been uh, super handy. Um, yeah, cool. So uh, really quickly, can everyone see my screen? Down yes. Question. Cool. All right, so uh, just a quick reminder that this has been recorded and it will be on our Maxon training team YouTube, uh, probably I would say tomorrow latest. And you know, yeah, if you missed the first one, um, you can always check that out. And what we'll do, we'll, um, 
we'll link to all the project files um, on there again, uh, like we do. So some people asking how they can get access to those. And I'm pretty sure, Jonas, did you say they're going to be able to get the files that you're working on today, being kind yeah, enough absolutely. to share those? Absolutely. I'm kind enough to do that. Perfect. Cool. Treat, treating us all. And lastly, uh, Lionel has also been generous enough to, he has a, a whole bunch of Udemy courses. Um, and so if you check out the handout, uh, the PDF on that, uh, he's, he's given us all 80% uh, off as well uh, of his kind of like different different sets using those codes there. So, you know, be sure to, to check those out because yeah, thanks for that, Lionel. Really appreciate it. Ooh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, really quickly, just before, yeah. Sorry, we overran. You know, you know how we how we love to do that. We always have so much, so much amazing stuff that, that we want to show you guys, and an hour just isn't long enough. Uh, so next week, so next Monday is all things kind of relating to hair inside of Redshift. So creating hair, setting up, and how we can actually that, actually render that out uh, in in Redshift. So yeah, definitely don't want to miss that one. And then yeah, week four. Oh, yeah. We're um, doing an everyday <laughs> challenge, which should be interesting, uh, but definitely a lot of fun. So something you don't want to miss for sure. Right, Absolutely. well, uh, yeah. Th thanks guys. Thanks for, thanks for showing a lot of cool stuff and thanks for being here. And thanks to everyone who asked the questions and you know, said hey to us in the chat. Like, we really appreciate that too. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the stuff that's happening this week and this month, all on our events page. And yeah, we'll see you all shit soon cool bye everyone bye 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 everyone bye, everybody